Welcome back to The Place We Find Ourselves. I'm Adam Young, and this is episode 18, in which we are going to engage the whole subject of hope. But before we begin, uh, several listeners have requested that I do an episode in which I respond to questions, either questions about past episodes or questions about topics that I have not yet addressed. So I'm going to do that. But first, I need your questions. So please email those to me at adamyoungcounseling at gmail.com, and you will be instrumental in shaping a future episode. Okay, let's dive into why your story makes it hard to hope. I'll begin with three sentences from Psalm 27. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Uh, That's three parts of Psalm 27. Now, I know the word hope doesn't appear once in those sentences, but in the last verse where it says, wait for the Lord, it's actually a Hebrew word, kavah, which is sometimes translated hope and sometimes translated wait. And that's instructive. It's helpful because the Hebrew language is telling us that there is a linkage between hoping and waiting. Hope has a lot to do with waiting. If you're hoping for something, you don't have it yet. So you're waiting for it. But hope is not synonymous with waiting. There's one more element to hope. Hope involves groaning. Groaning from the inside. Longing for something. Hope is groaning inwardly while waiting expectantly. It's groaning, it's longing for something while at the same time expecting it to happen. And boy, that is hard to do. Now, this is precisely what the German philosopher Nietzsche couldn't stand about Christianity. Nietzsche said, look, you Christians talk about hoping in God. You say, even though your life is not going well currently, put your hope in God and things will change in the future. And Nietzsche says, look, this is what's so abusive about Christianity. It prolongs your torment because you keep hoping for something that is never going to happen. Nietzsche called hope the evil of all evils because it prolongs your torment. Now, what torment is he talking about? The torment of longing for something that is never going to come to fruition. If you're a Christian, you probably have this sense that you're supposed to disagree with everything Nietzsche says, but he's putting his finger on something here uh, that, that's, that's, that, that matters. Think about your own life. There's something that you want. Your graduate school, a child, your dad to actually be a dad. And you've wanted it for years and you've done everything you can to get it and you still haven't gotten it. Isn't it foolish to hope that this year you'll get into graduate school? That next month you'll conceive? That this afternoon your dad will call and tell you, that he's entered counseling and he's beginning to realize how he has failed you as a father and he wants to talk. Your your dad is the same today as he's always been. You've tried to talk to him and nothing works. Does it really make sense to hope that he's going to change now? This is Nietzsche's point. Hoping that your dad will change, that's just foolish. It's putting your head in the sand and ignoring what your life has already taught you. Far better to say, look, my dad's just not going to change. So stop wanting him to. There's the key, wanting. Hope is letting yourself want. And when you let yourself want something that you don't have, you experience an inward groaning, a longing, not yet met desire. If you do that, if you let yourself want, let yourself long for something, you're halfway to hope, but you're still not there. Hope also requires that you wait expectantly. Hope is not merely longing 
for a wife. It is longing for a wife while at the same time expecting to meet her tonight. Groaning inwardly while waiting expectantly. Psalm 27 again. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The psalmist is saying, in the land of the living, before I die, in this life, God will hear my cry and give me what I long for. Do you sense the agony yet inside? Are you letting yourself entertain longings for things that you deeply want and have perhaps wanted for some time? Hope is agonizing. Hope is agonizing. Hope is both longing for a husband and anticipating walking down the aisle in your imagination, seeing it happen. Hope is both yearning for more intimacy with your spouse and at the same time anticipating a romantic evening tonight. Hope is longing for more meaningful employment and envisioning yourself at your new job, anticipating it, all the while wrestling with God until you are at your new job. Living in hope, in other words, requires three things to happen at the same time. Number one, bringing our specific longings and desires to God. Number two, expecting God to meet those desires. And number three, wrestling with how he can be a good father when he hasn't met the desire yet. All of that is required for biblical hope. Now, there are alternatives to hope, and here are two of the most common. The first alternative to hope is a slow deadening of desire. And the second alternative is cynicism. Your body naturally yearns and groans. I mean, look at a child. They are a mass of longings. They always want something. So groaning, longing, is the natural disposition of the human heart. But what happens when you long for something and you don't get it? Disappointment. And in time, disappointments pile up. When disappointments pile up, it creates questions about God, doubts, anger, resentment. When repeated disappointments make longing for something too painful, the tendency is to kill your desire. The enemy you feel is your desire. If I didn't want that thing so badly, I wouldn't hurt so much. And so, slowly but surely, you try to deaden your desire, to numb it out. Instead of hoping that your husband will begin pursuing your heart, you say to yourself, he's just not like that. And besides, it's a broken world. Your expectations, maybe they're just too high. He's not like that. What is that? What are you doing? You are deadening your desire to be pursued by your husband. But it's also a deadening of your hope in God to do the miraculous and turn your husband toward you in pursuit of your heart. In 2008, Darren Aronofsky did a film called The Wrestler. I am not recommending it. Uh, it's pretty dark, but I don't know of any film that more accurately depicts the killing of desire than this one scene in The Wrestler. Uh, Mickey Rourke plays The Wrestler and Evan Rachel Wood plays his daughter. It's clear from the beginning that father and daughter are deeply alienated from each other, and the daughter, Evan Rachel Wood, she's really angry. But as the film unfolds, Mickey Rourke's character makes movement to rebuild his relationship with his daughter. And he confesses how, how he's failed her as a father, and how he wants things to be different, and he wants to make it right. And Evan Rachel Wood, she begins to hope that there can be reconciliation. And so they set up a time to go out to a restaurant and begin rebuilding what is so broken. In the next scene, you see Evan Rachel Wood sitting in her house alone, devastated. Her dad never showed up to the restaurant. 
A couple hours later, dad knocks on her door and this is what happens. At first, she just starts yelling at him for not showing up uh, and how this is just like every other time in their relationship. She's absolutely furious. Uh, but then you see her experience this profound shift inside. She calms down, way down. She gets this cold, serious look on her face. And then she says, this relationship is broken permanently. There's no fixing this. And then you can just watch her face as she deadens her desire. And she says, I don't want to see you. I don't want anything from you. We're done. It was too painful for her to desire a better relationship. And so she killed her desire. It was too painful to continue hoping that next time dad would show up at the restaurant. Deadening desire is saying, I'm done wanting this thing. I'm done. Now, the second alternative to hope is cynicism. Repeated disappointments inevitably lead to cynicism. Instead of waiting expectantly for the letter that says you got accepted to such and such graduate program, cynicism says it's not going to happen. Instead of starting some new endeavor, some new uh, job, s s some new venture, which would invite you to hope, you think that would never work. Cynicism is often fueled by the following sentence. I'm just being realistic. It's not that I lack hope. It's that I'm realistic. Realistic about what I can expect from life in this world. It would be foolish to hope that my husband will really begin engaging my heart because we've fought about it for seven years and he hasn't done it yet. I'm not cynical. I'm realistic. Now, what's the problem with that sentence if you're a Christian? There's nothing more unrealistic than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a form of cynicism that I call Christian cynicism. There's nothing Christian about it, but I call it Christian cynicism because so many Christians not only have it, but they justify it with theology. And it's a cynicism that is fueled with sentences like, hey, it's a broken world. It's a broken world. Or I'm not going to get everything I long for until heaven. Have you heard those sentences? Have you said those sentences? Now, the dilemma with those two sentences is that they're true. It is a broken world. And your longings won't be fully met until heaven. However, we often use those sentences as a way to kill hope, to kill desire, but they're utterly cynical. It's cynicism bolstered by theology, but it has nothing to do with Jesus. Why does it have nothing to do with Jesus? Because it is a denial of the reality of the resurrection. Is it a broken world? Yes. But his broken body was resurrected. Are you going to have all your longings met in this world? Of course not. But here's the catch. You don't know which ones. You don't know which ones. The question you have to wrestle with is this. What can you hope for from God in the land of the living? Psalm 27, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Many of you have killed hope by saying... God doesn't promise such and such until heaven, and so I shouldn't hope for him to give it to me until then. Cynicism is the byproduct of repeated experiences of powerlessness. If you wrestle with hope, it is almost guaranteed that you have experienced a great deal of powerlessness in your life. If you had to write your story through the lens of powerlessness— what would the chapter titles be? What are those areas, what, what are the chapters of your life where you have felt the most powerlessness? The core of trauma is powerlessness. It is the inability 
to say or do something to make whatever bad is happening stop happening. In Dan Allender's book, The Wounded Heart, he identifies three places of powerlessness that are familiar uh, to many of us. And I just want to share what they are because they're so core to our war with hope. The first category is powerlessness in your attempt to make your dysfunctional family functional. How did you attempt to make your dysfunctional family work? What did you try to do to make it better? Here's how Dan puts it in The Wounded Heart. He says, The child can become a prisoner to the hope that something can be done to lift mom's spirits or keep dad from being enraged. The passionate desire to see the family change energizes the child to pursue academic, athletic, social, or religious excellence. The result is deeper disappointment that mom or dad did not change. The impossibility of being enough to change the dysfunctional family leads to the initial experience of powerlessness. Did you get that? What he's saying is you tried something to make your family work better. Academic pursuits, athletic, social, religious, I I don't know how you tried, but your efforts failed. And that was an experience of immense powerlessness. Category number two is powerlessness to stop the abuse. If you were abused, what did you do to try to make it stop? Because you did something. And what do you think happened in your brain when your attempts to make it stop didn't work? Category three is powerlessness to stop the pain in your adult life. And, you know, in some ways, this is the most agonizing. You have tried so many different things. You have read so many books. You have gone to counseling. You have listened to sermons. You have gone to conferences. I I don't know what you have tried, but so many of you have tried anything you could get your hands on in your attempt to get well. And if you're a Christian, there is always this element of powerlessness with God Why won't you heal my pain? It is the cry, God, I am trying all these different. Why won't you heal me? What do I need to do to get you to heal me? If you have known something of powerlessness, then you have an inner war with hope. And hopelessness is a constant pull. The Bible takes powerlessness and hopelessness very seriously. The the biblical metaphor for powerlessness and hopelessness is barrenness. Barrenness. The entire starting point for the story of Israel is barrenness. Sarah can't get pregnant. That's how it all begins. That's how it all begins. But it doesn't stop with Sarah. This theme appears over and over again. And over in the scripture, Rebecca, Rachel, Hannah, they're all barren. The mothers of the first three generations of Israelites were barren. (laughs) Do you think God is saying something here? Where is the barrenness in your life right now? Where do you feel powerless to create life and goodness and newness? The whole point of the barrenness of Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Hannah, is that God loves to work in the barren places in our lives. Here's how Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann puts it. He says, barrenness is the arena of God's life-giving action. Can the closed womb of the present Can the closed womb of the present be broken open to give birth to a new future? 
the utter impossibility of the promise becomes evident. Abraham knows what is possible. He lives in restless torment. Walter Brueggemann. Can you relate to Abraham here? I sure can. Do you know something of the restless torment that comes from the war between the part of you that believes that God actually cares and will help you and the part of you that looks around and sees all this evidence that God is not coming through? In Isaiah 49, God talks about how the Israelites will one day return from exile. And after painting a picture of what that return will look like, God says this, Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. This is talking about the hope of returning from exile something very much in the land of the living. The difficulty is that you don't know which of your longings God will meet in the land of the living, and you don't want to wrestle with God about meeting those particular desires. Herein lies the biggest reason we hate hope. Hope forces us to wrestle with God. Most wrestling with God is avoided by a very simple phrase, if it be your will. You express a desire to God, and then you tack on this phrase, if it be your will. Not my will, but yours be done. Right? That's the sentence. And it is a beautiful sentence. As long as it comes after a 12-round match of wrestling with God. Now, uh, you may be thinking, wait a minute, aren't we supposed to surrender our will to God's will? Yes, but that's just the point. You're called to surrender your will to God's will. And what does the word surrender mean? It is to give in after a long, drawn out, bloody war. You can't surrender until you have fought with God. And generals never surrender until they have fought to the end of their strength. Surrender only comes in a moment of exhaustion. If you're not exhausted from fighting with God, from bringing the longings of your heart repeatedly to God, then the words, not my will, but yours be done, those aren't words of surrender. They are words to avoid hope which is to avoid warring and wrestling with your God. You can't talk about hope without talking about wrestling. If you don't find yourself regularly wrestling with God, chances are you don't live with much hope because hope creates longing in you and unfulfilled longings inevitably drive you to God because God is the only one who can satisfy the longing. God is the only one that can make that thing happen. Until you take the risk of hoping that God will fulfill the desires of your heart in this life, until you bring your disappointment and anger to him again and again, God will always remain strangely impersonal to you. You might know him as God, the savior of the world, but you won't know him as what the psalmists call the God of my rescue. The God of my rescue. If you look up the etymology of the word disappointment, you find that it originally meant to miss an appointment with someone. A, a disappointment was a broken appointment. Ultimately, all disappointment carries with it the sense of a broken appointment with God. I expected God to show up and he didn't. God is the one who could have let me get into that school, and he didn't. He didn't show up for me. God is the one who could have prevented that illness, and he didn't. He didn't show up. A disappointment. A broken appointment. One of the reasons we hate hope so much is that it requires us to live a both-and kind of life. Christians are meant to constantly hold together both death and resurrection. 
This is why Paul says that we're to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, both and. And many of us would rather live either or. A life focused solely on resurrection is not hope, it's optimism. Hope has nothing to do with optimism. Optimism is a denial of the darkness that permeates this world. We don't live both and well. We, we live primarily either or. Some of us focus on the darkness of this world, and we see it everywhere, but we have a hard time seeing the thousands of places where the Spirit of God is doing beautiful, redemptive things. Others of us focus on the beauty in this world but we turn a blind eye to all the evil right in front of us. But Christianity is both and. A life of both and means that you are just as apt to be weeping one moment as you are to be laughing the next. You're never far from weeping because you have your eyes wide open to the darkness of this world, and you're never far from laughing and celebrating because you also see the thousands of places of God's redemptive work all around you. There's a spirit of optimism that has invaded the church. It appeals to us because it allows us to escape staying connected to the longings of our hearts. It allows us to turn away from darkness and pain, to pretend it isn't real. Much of what you hear in, in Bible studies and small groups are sentences that shame you for admitting that you have longings, that you groan, that you yearn, that you have unmet desire. What do you do when someone in a group expresses an unfulfilled longing? When someone expresses you know, disappointment over not getting into a particular school or anger over not being married or sorrow over not being reconciled to their father? The tendency is to subtly do one of three things. Either, number one, encourage them to believe more in the sovereignty of God. Maybe it's not God's will for you to get into that graduate school. Number two, wonder if they are idolizing that which they long for. It kind of sounds like you're making an idol out of being married. Like that's too important to you. Or number three, suggests that they are wanting too much. Aren't your expectations for your dad too high? You know, he may not be able to give you what you want. Is it really reasonable to hope for reconciliation with your dad, you know, given his background? When you respond in one of those three ways, what's going on? You know, the expression of the other person's sorrow, anger, disappointment, it exposes your deep, discomfort with those emotions in your own life. That, that's oftentimes what's happening. And you respond to the person uh, with the same sentences you use on yourself to keep your desires under control. You're not being hypocritical. You're not even necessarily being cruel. You're just telling them what you tell yourself. Are you familiar with the parable of the persistent widow? Jesus tells this story in Luke 18. And it goes like this, a widow kept going to a judge to demand that she get justice against the person who harmed her. Let me say that again. That's, that's the story. You can read it. It's in Luke 18. A widow keeps going back to a judge. Why? To demand that she get justice against the person who harmed her. And because the widow keeps coming back to insist on her case, the judge finally relents and gives her justice. And then Jesus says this, Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? Here's the point. It's not called the parable of the widow who learned to surrender to God's will. The whole point is that she refused to take no for an answer. She knew nothing of maybe it's not God's will for me to get justice against this particular adversary. She refused to take no for an answer. So how much hope do you have? 
How much hope do you have? The danger is that you're thinking to yourself, okay, I need to conjure up more hope. Two problems with that. Number one, you can't. You can't just conjure up more hope. But, but the bigger problem is that you actually have far more hope than you realize. You may not be fond of it, but will you have the integrity to confess how much hope you actually still have? Now, how can I say that? Well, think of all the disappointments that you've endured in your life. Think of all the prayers you've prayed, all the times you've cried out to God, and he has not come through for you in the way that you wanted, and yet you're still interested in God. You're still talking to God. You're still pursuing God. You haven't given up on God. You know what Nietzsche is talking about. You're wanting healing or help in some area of your life, and you've gone to God about it, and the healing or the help has not yet come. That's tormenting. And yet you still come back to God. You still pursue God. You think about God. You may pray, you may read scripture, but you keep coming back. Nietzsche calls that foolish. The Bible calls it hope. As a therapist, one of the paradoxes that I can bear witness to is this. The people who have suffered trauma, abuse, heartache, often have immense love for Jesus and immense hope. They often hate the hope that they have, but they have it. What Paul wrote in Romans seems to be a good description for their life. And Paul wrote this, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Suffering, do the math, suffering leads often to the creation of a robust hope in the very people whom have the least evidence to suggest that hope is reasonable. Now, last point, in a very real sense, our hope is not merely in God. Our hope is God. The essence of rescue, the essence of rescue is not primarily receiving that which you asked for, but rather experiencing the responsiveness of God to the hurt in your heart. Let me say that again. The essence of rescue is not getting what you asked for. It is experiencing the responsiveness of God. Do you hear the attachment? Do you hear the attachment language? It is experiencing the responsiveness of God to the hurt in your heart. It's not merely the, you know, the school you wanted to get into or the husband or the healing of an illness that satisfies us. It is the satisfaction, the rest of knowing I have a father in heaven who is deeply involved in the desires of my heart. I have a father who cares. I have a father who responds. Will you hope? Will you entertain your longings and give them an audience before God? Will you bring your disappointments back to God to keep your desires alive? I want to end with a quote from Barbara Kingsolver's novel, Animal Dreams, and this is it's so beautiful. This is what she writes. The very least you can do in your life is to figure out what you hope for. And the most you can do is to live inside that hope. Not admire it from a distance, but live right in it, under its roof. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Place We Find Ourselves. Don't forget to email me your questions for the upcoming Q&A episode. Thank you to Rick Wilson for providing the music for this podcast. May you wrestle well with hope this week. <laughs> <laughs>